Good evening, one and all. Fellow citizens, I address you tonight on the date for the next general election in our country. As you are probably aware, the fifth anniversary of the last general election is November 28, 2016. Our Constitution says in Section 55, Subsection 2, that Parliament, unless sooner dissolved, shall continue for five years from the date of the first sitting of the House after any dissolution, and shall then stand dissolved. This would mean that general elections are constitutionally due for the latest three months after the first sitting of Parliament, which was held on January 5th, 2012. In effect, the government would have had until April 5th, 2017 to call a general election. However, I have decided in the interest of our country to call the general election several months ahead of its due date to ensure peace, stability, and certainty in our country and its affairs. The opposition United Workers' Party has agitated for elections for months, and on our side, the St. Lucia Labour Party says, we are ready. You would have noticed that while there was a debate on the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the financial year 2016-2017, which of course most members of the opposition did not attend, there was no presentation of a budget address. The explanations for what appears to be unusual are rather simple. Section 79, subsection 1 of our Constitution requires that the Minister for Finance prepares and lay the estimates of revenue and expenditure before or not later than 30 days after the commencement of the financial year. In turn, Section 79, subsection 2 of the Constitution provides for an appropriation bill to be introduced in the House of Assembly to authorize expenditure from the Consolidated Fund. These are the two fundamental requirements established by the Constitution to allow expenditure by the government. Clearly, we need to ensure that any expenditure by the government is fully authorized. And we have done so. Given my decision to call general elections just after the passage of the Appropriation Bill 2016-17, I felt it best that the government elected by the will of the people in the general election, which I'm about to announce, be given the opportunity to present, within a reasonable period after the general election, its economic and policy proposals by way of a financial statement to the House. Incidentally, that was the view I held and expressed way back in 1997, when a general election was held on May 23, 1997, just after the presentation of the budget in that year. We come to this juncture after four years of collective effort and sacrifice. These past four years have been a period of adjustment for our economy and indeed for all of us. I remain eternally grateful to you for the support and understanding that you have shown for the adjustments we have made to ensure that our economy became stronger, better, and more resilient. Some of our measures were not always popular, but it was never in doubt that the measures were implemented in the best interests of our country. By our common will and collective efforts, we saved our country from the IMF. The results of our efforts have now begun to yield fruits. Our economy has returned to growth. Last year, it grew by 1.3%. We have reduced our fiscal deficit from 9.6% of gross domestic product in 2012 to 3.1% in 2015. This is a remarkable reduction by any measure. Our current account surplus increased to $73.8 million in 2015-16. We also registered a significantly improved performance in the primary surplus, which grew to $45.3 million in 2015-16 from $3.7 million in 2014-2015. Unemployment is finally trending downwards, 
from a high of 24.5% to 20% in the last quarter. There was a net increase in the number of employed persons by 3.8% to 77,131. In the fourth quarter alone, our labor force grew by 5,220 persons employed in that quarter. It is clear we are the only government with a plan for jobs. We need to continue on our path. Tourism arrivals continue to increase steadily. For the first time, we surpassed the one million mark for combined stay over and cruise passenger arrivals. The construction sector expanded by 7.4%. Manufacturing too is on the rebound. The sector grew by an estimated 13.7%. Agricultural production, though uneven, is rising, with banana exports surging by 35.3%. Many of us may not be aware, but St. Lucia is the Windward Island still. In fact, I would say the only Windward Island still exporting bananas to the United Kingdom. Investment has also returned to our country. Currently, two major new hotels are under construction. Some 700 St. Lucians are employed at the Royalton at Cap Estate. Another 275 are employed at the Harbor Club in Rodney Bay. When the Royalton is completed, some 650 to 700 St. Lucians are expected to find jobs. In the next few days, I expect a start trading ceremony but it will be held to signal the construction of the new hotel, Sunset Bay Hotel at Sabuisha in Swazel. The developers have already paid for the land. The local private sector, too, is investing in our country again. Unicoma Limited, the parent company of Court St. Lucia, is constructing its new headquarters. The Diana Center in the city is nearing completion. The public sector, too, is also playing its part. A sort trading ceremony has already been held to confirm the commencement of the administrative complex in Dufort. Two new bridges, one in Tomazo and the other in Canaries, are about to commence construction. Plans are now at an advanced stage for the commencement of the secondary roads improvement project to pave the way for the expansion of the shock to Grosley Highway. The European Union has confirmed financing of a new bridge at Piai and the reconstruction of the Venus Road in the ancillary quarter. The prospects for the health sector are promising. The creative industries have begun to take shape. Youth and sports are in good hands. We continue to educate the children of St. Lucia to equip them to be the future drivers of our country's destiny. We provided our students from Form 3 to Form 5 in secondary schools with laptops. We plan to extend this program to form one of all our secondary schools. We are well on our way to diversifying our energy needs by developing alternative sources of energy. All over the country, we are opening modern state-of-the-art information technology centers to give all situations free access to computers and high-speed internet for learning and entrepreneurship. Our country is once again proud resilient and on the move. However, it is also delicately poised. And all of these gains and the sacrifices we have made to get us here can be quickly undone and reversed by recklessness and irresponsible actions. One such example is a recent opportunistic and bizarre proposal by the leader of the United Workers' Party on VAT. The leader of the UWP, at a recent meeting on the boulevard, stated that his party will do, quote, an immediate reduction and ultimate removal of the dreaded VAT, unquote. He added, quote again, we will find a more creative way and less onerous way of raising revenues generated by VAT, unquote. These are his words, not mine. So in the mind of Alan Chastney, VAT is dreaded, and yet, at a town hall meeting in Grosley last night, at which some 20 persons were in attendance, he told his audience that, quote, VAT is the best and most effective tax in the world. No argument, unquote. Now, which is it? Ask yourself, why this incredible about turn and inconsistency? 
In 2015, 2016, our country earned $346.37 million from VAT. It is this revenue that pays for our nurses, doctors, teachers, police officers, civil servants, and repays our debt. For every 1% reduction in VAT revenue, the country loses $7 million. The question then is this. What are the new creative measures? What are the new taxes that Alan Chastney plans to impose on the people of St. Lucia to make up for this staggering loss of $346.37 million in revenue? In 2007, Sir John Compton announced in his only budget address before his death that his government will introduce VAT. He said so in these words, quote, Madam Speaker, I wish to draw to the attention of this honorable house that VAT is not a tax with which we are unfamiliar. We currently have on our books a number of transaction taxes, such as the consumption tax, hotel accommodation tax, and the travel tax. It is more efficient to bring all those taxes under a single legislative and administrative structure. That would widen the tax base while easing the burden of taxpayers. The VAT will not be another tax but a replacement for some existing taxes. It will be a broad-based, comprehensive, and simplified system of taxation on transactions. During the course of this financial year, we will be consulting with you on an appropriate schedule for implementation of this modified tax system. That quote can be found on page 42 of the Budget Address 2007-2008. Sir John's successor, the Honorable Stevenson King, in his 2011 Budget Address, reiterated Sir John's comments promising to introduce VAT in April 2012. He prepared draft legislation and engaged civil society on the merits of VAT. Apparently, the wisdom of Sir John Compton in announcing the introduction of VAT in 2007 was conveyed to his successor, the Honorable Stevenson King, but somehow not to King's successor as leader of the United Workers' Party, Alan Chastney, even though he was part of the cabinet that made those decisions. Our government believes that VAT has settled reasonably well. It is not perfect. Adjustments may well be necessary from time to time, but our number one priority must remain the creation of new jobs. And this will be the continuing focus of a new Labour government. We believe that more money must be put in the pockets of St. Lucians by reducing on the number of persons who pay personal income taxes, reducing corporate income tax to encourage even more investment, and ensuring a fair and just property tax regime. We believe that our revenue base must be protected to pay for hospital care for our people, pay our teachers to educate our children, provide more access to university education for our young people, and to protect our elderly, our poor, and our vulnerable. These are the issues before us. Fellow solutions, the die is cast. The decision time has arrived. Today, I advise the Governor General to dissolve the Parliament of St. Lucia and to issue writs of election to pave the way for the general election. The general election will be held on June 6, 2016. Nomination day will be May 27, 2016. Good night, and may God bless and protect each and every one of you and our island home, St. Lucia, I thank you.